Tom, do you mind saying a few words about yourself and what you're going to talk about before you get into it? Yes. Uh, so, uh, from uh, moving on to uh, being an advanced materials technologist at Rolls-Royce Nuclear, uh, finally joining Lloyd's, I think about two years ago now as a materials specialist, and moving to... Um, our new innovation department, innovation function, which has existed for about two years as a lead specialist in innovation. So my role today is to take information from the market, information from our own internal people. What should Lloyds be thinking about? What, what should we be developing in terms of products and services that really add value to our clients? The main two areas that I look at are cyber, so autonomous systems, remote access systems, cybersecurity, also our advanced manufacturing strategy as well, which includes additive manufacturing. Um, so I'm just going to talk today um, a bit of a view of where we see the market value in AM, uh, what it can do for our clients, and also specifically on the certification aspect, how do you build confidence in these parts, how Lloyd's Register as a third party is addressing that, because the standard landscape for AM is still developing, uh, and obviously that's different by industry. So. Uh, briefly, I think uh, maybe most of you here know who Lloyd's are. Uh, we're a third-party assurance company. We've been around for about 250 years now. Um, and one of our main functions today is to really enable safe adoption of innovation in industry. So just a brief overview of AM. Uh, I won't go through these processes because I think they've been covered quite well earlier this morning. Um, but Moving on to where we see technology benefits, which I think we've covered quite well in complexity, customization, consolidation. Um, these slides will be distributed afterwards. So I've got about 35 to get through in about 22 minutes. So um, obviously you can read them at your own leisure a bit later on. Um, but one of the big areas I want to talk about is the supply chain benefits. So when we're considering things like part obsolescence, uh, manufacturing location, uh, and lead time uh, to spares that you actually need. So when we're th thinking about nuisance parts, about what you need to continually replace. And one of the big concepts that we're talking about lot, a lot lately, uh, this says virtual spares, but it actually means virtual stores, um, is about the shift from shipping globally to manufacturing locally. Um, and Two of the big points I want to take a look at, well, a few of the big points I want to look at here is that in 10 years, uh, German spare parts suppliers uh, will save 3 billion annually by using 3D printing through uh, the virtual stars process. Uh, and also, over here, all the way down this side, is that companies in the future won't be so much trading in spares, they'll be trading in the copyright designs for uh, spare parts. These are two of the big changes we see out there. So just making our way around a bit. So within five years, more than 85% of spare parts suppliers will be incorporating 3D printing into their process. And I've got an example of some delivery companies doing that today. Um, I would say that uh, most people we spot, speak to aren't really aware yet of the full potential that can be gained from using 3D printed parts. We're still on that adoption curve at the early, uh, early adopters, the innovators, really grabbing this technology. Um, just move on to the next slide. So when we're talking about value, where actually is it? So this was provided courtesy of strategy. So they went out into the industry, conducted a survey with suppliers, with end users, and just asked them, where, how do you see AM? affecting various uh, costs in your business. So you can see whether they responded, whether it would decrease costs, whether it wouldn't affect costs at all, whether it would increase costs. And the big one here is in warehousing. So are you going to have warehouses all around the world with uh, millions, hundreds of millions of spare parts in them at all times that you're not going to use? Um, my background in recent years has been in marine. Uh, and we know of ship operators out there that are sailing with $300 million worth of spares at sea at any one time. There's, that, that, that situation is uh, it's, it's, it's quite astonishing, really. Do they really need that? 
So we also see uh, reductions in production costs, logistics, uh, things like capital costs and investment. Obviously, this requires some investment, some thinking up front, but you realize the benefits later on. So just as a high-level look from the current state to, the, to uh, what 3D printing might give us, and it's all about a simplified supply chain. Fewer suppliers made to order. There are lower labor units in uh, bringing that production closer to where you actually need it. There's no need to follow cheap labor rates, tooling costs, and there's a faster reaction time as well. So it's all about local production, faster response times, the reduction in warehouse costing, uh, reduced inventory costs, low cost delivery, and faster delivery as well. So DHL and, U and UPS are working on this at the minute. DHL have what they call, uh, I think it's called an end of runway, AM facility, which uh, basically takes the idea that the part is produced at the point of transport, so it's not made somewhere and shipped to an airport and sent somewhere else the spare part service center for DHL is sat at the airport and produces the part and then it gets straight on a flight to where it needs to go. And UPS are working on this as well. Uh, DHL have identified this as a significant threat to their business model. So in terms of markets, I know, I know we've spoke about aerospace, automotive, medical, but where actually are they? So we see aerospace being around TRL five, six, seven, tooling quite high at nine. Automotives get in there. We saw some Formula One examples earlier. Medicals really pick this up uh, when you think about personalized uh, medical solutions as well. So specific for, specifically for oil and gas, uh, Smartech Publishing have estimated that within oil and gas, uh, the sector will generate $2 billion in AM revenue by 2027. And I know this isn't just in oil and gas, for example. Uh, globally, I think uh, I read a study last week that predicts a compound annual growth rate of about 17.5% through to 2025 for AM technologies. So this is growing. So if this is growing and it's so fabulous and there are so many benefits, how do we actually build confidence in the process? Well, there are a lot of challenges. I know this is very wordy. Um, so existing standards or aspects of these can be used for AM where relevant. Well, sorry, I should start at the beginning. Uh, most existing standards don't actually account for AM. So we can use existing standards um, to help us, it, it, but they can't be used in isolation. Uh, they can raise questions such as, what materials properties should I use? Do I need a design factor? Are my fatigue curves still valid? Um, current inspection techniques, are they capable of detecting AM-specific flaws within the design? Um, and are AM builds repeatable? And if they're not, then what's the cause of those variations? So. What we need uh, in industry, and this isn't just oil and gas, this is most places, uh, is AM-specific standards to fill those gaps. Most of them are still in development, and there's a very complex map of where they are in a slide or two. Uh, some have been published. Um, to bridge the gap in the meantime, what Lloyds Register did with TWI was build AM guidelines, which are basically the considerations you need to have when you produce an AM part, an AM design. Uh, they're available online, and uh, there'll be some contact details later if anybody wants to talk about them, or talk about them later. Um, and obviously there's a lot of academic and industrial research still ongo ongoing, which feeds into those standards. So this is a bit what it looks like at the minute. Uh, hopefully it sort of makes sense. But within the areas, these are the standards groups working. So we're looking at things like terminology, processes, systems, materials, test methods and quality specs, data and design, AM for specific aerospace applications, and the environmental health and safety considerations as well. So 
Lawyers Registry, is, Lawyers Registry is part of most of these working groups, uh, along with our other industry partners as well. So you can see how the standards are building up. Uh, for example, requirements for purchased AM parts, what specific NDE techniques you need for AM, uh, guide for constructing, constructing round robin studies, uh, powder properties, and so on. The, the list just goes on. But there's also the bigger picture stuff as well. Uh, when you start talking about the, the digitalization of the supply chain, you're talking about uh, virtual stores units, uh, trading in copyright data instead of actual parts. It throws up lots of things around intellectual property. So uh, if it's easily shared and re replicated, how is traceability proven? Uh, product liability, who's to blame if something goes wrong? Was it the person who made the design? Was it the person who manufactured the part? Compliance as well. So where AM specific standards are not yet developed, and we'll have a bit of an example of this. I'll go through a case where we actually did this for the first time. Um, how can you actually achieve compliance? Tax also. So uh, the line between the manufacturer and the consumer is changing. So at what point is that product actually subject to tax? And insurance. So how can the cause of a failure be traced? How do you determine liability? That's product liability. Uh, and what disclaimers will insurers ins insist upon? I suppose the point is that this throws up a lot of questions that we need to address. But So how LR's gone about it? Uh, we've got two documents, if you went out and searched the web, um, out there in the world at the minute, is Within our business, we've created, like say, the guidelines for certification of metallic parts with TWI. That was updated, it's on version two now, uh, that was updated in March last year. Um, we also have the, uh, for, I suppose I should go back, for, for people who don't know, um, Lloyd's Register, our business units, so being marine, energy, management systems and inspection, what you probably know as LRQA, uh, are wholly owned by the Lloyd's Register Foundation. Um, I think we're the largest charity in the UK. Um, we're devoted to engineering research um, that has a practical, measurable application in the world. So everything we fund has to have something at the end that delivers something of value. Within the foundation, we've produced the roadmap for additive manufacturing, which is all based on this. So qualification of technology, confidence in the supply chain, competent and qualified workforce, safety enhancements, these are the challenges we see, the reasons behind them, and what our goals should be. So developing things like defect acceptance cri criteria, qualification of parts, assurance of parts upon process control and monitoring, creating an academic framework, and smart materials as well. And we see 4D printing appearing down the bottom there as well. With the high level goal between us is that we enable design innovation for the safe adoption of these technologies in critical infrastructure. And that's about bringing our experience, which we've had in industry for years, uh, a long time in asset integrity, and how we apply that to new technologies. So with certification at the, at the core, this is sort of a high level view of it. Uh, you'll find this graph in the LRF roadmap, I believe. So within certification, we see these five main blocks being inspection, design, materials, manufacture, and post-processing. So just briefly on some of them. So we need to look at accurate model translation uh, within design. Uh, within materials, powder production is important. Recycling and sampling methods as well. Within manufacturing, how do we control the build? What are the pre-build checks? Th these are starting to build the list of things that we'll be checking or we need to consider when we're building confidence in these parts. So within post-processing, what are the surface finishing procedures specific to AM? And inspection as well, destructive and non-destructive testing. So uh, I said a few moments ago, are your current NDT methods applicable for AM? But on the other hand, there might be some parts you use today that you can't NDT where you need to. So you can also design AM parts so that you can do that now. And obviously things like operator qualifications and competencies. So it's all about addressing the variability and, and inherent risk. I won't go through each one of these because I want to move on to the case study. But it's, it's, we, we've seen this before on the previous slides of the processes. So 
a lot of things we're familiar with, uh, mechanical testing, heat treatments, uh, reports on the manufacturing process, how do you do cleanup and handling, storage of materials, and design as well. So how do we actually do it, and how did we actually do it? Uh, I think it was last year, maybe in November, December time, uh, we certified the first oil and gas component uh, working with the Safer Plug Company and our friends at the MTC and also people at the TWI as well, which was a six-inch gateway manifold. So I'll just spend the last nine minutes talking you through the process, what the steps were, to show you how we actually did that. So here's a bit of the news stories. So we were the first in industry to do it. Uh, it's a titanium part. So so what is it? Uh, it's a single component within an assembly for a pipeline isolation tool. So it's not actually a pressure, uh, it's not part of a pressure boundary, I don't think. Uh, so uh, it's actually a good example of AM. Uh, it couldn't be produced, and you'll see why on the next slide, using traditional manufacturing techniques. So between us, it was the client, SPC, was the design, the AM, AM facility, who actually made it, was a company called 3TRPD, and we acted as the certification body. So this is why you couldn't make it by traditional manufacturing techniques, uh, and this is where the benefits of AM and what you can actually build that you couldn't build before actually come in. So it's made by the powder bed fusion method using uh, titanium, um, SPC created a technology qualification plan, LR and TWI guidance notes were used, which we've talked about before, and, and we also used an ASTM standard F2924, which was one of the standards published for the specification for titanium-6, aluminium-4, vanadium, powder bed fusion. So what this component basically just does to just wrap up is it interacts the control components of an autonomous pipeline isolation tool, this part here. So what do we do? Uh, one of the key things with this, because it's a new technology, it's a new process, it's a new way of doing things, it's very important to get engaged right from the very beginning. So when you're starting to think about this, and this is a lot of the work we're doing now uh, as Lloyds is, uh, we've, we've been building over the last few years a lot of experience in how we help clients understand where AM would be beneficial, where it wouldn't, uh, what they need to think about when they're building it, what they need to think about when we're certifying it. We've also been helping with the business case as well, because uh, everything needs that, of course. Um, so it all starts with a kickoff meeting where we define the project certification requirements and agree what the project gates are. So, approaching SPC, we knew the STM standard exists. We were going to use our guidance notes for uh, metallic parts by AM. Um, LR would typically lead that meeting. We just define, lay out the roadmap of what we're actually going to do. So, following this, the first real deliverable, if you like, is a facility audit. So, the facility, uh, to con check that it conforms to capability and quality controls. This isn't something new. Um, this happens a lot out there. So this was with 3T RPD as the manufacturer. Um, so we just needed access to their facility to go and do this. Um, and we look at the three things that everybody will be familiar with, which is people, process, and product. So starting with people, we're looking at things like training logs, certificates for programmers and operators, PPE as well. Um, Process, so what are the standard operating procedures? Equipment installation, control of route cards, eh and uh, with the product. When we come to do the certification of the product, the facility audit report is an input to that. Um, obviously, with, with the end goal being, the end point being that the facility through this audit is conf confirmed as having the capability to produce the parts with to a consistent standard. So one of the important things, uh, li like a casting process, like, like with steel manufacturer as it is today, you, you only get out as good as you put into it. 
Um, so powder characteriz characterization is an important aspect to this to check that it meets purchase specifications and standards. So you can see through this that SPC is the end, end client are receiving our outputs of this. Uh, 3T RPD, we're sourcing the powder and performing powder testing. And LR goes and does what we usually do, which is providing our third party assurance through witnessing those uh, testing um, to give confidence that it was done correctly. So skipping people, because that's fairly standard, uh, but in the process, again, it's checking we have standard operating procedures for how we do this um, and how you actually sample the material. It's like with any other sampling process, you don't just take a skim off the top of the nearest thing to you. You need to actually get a representative sample of the powder. Um, storage and handling procedures as well. Uh, I think we've seen um, before when we've done facilities audits that people store in two different powder types very, very close to each other. Um, and you need to consider the risks not only of those getting mixed up accidentally, but um, also things like a, you can get a disgruntled employee or something throwing this in there. So how do you actually control that? Um, your powder purchase specifications, how do you build those? Uh, material safety data sheets, again, this is all stuff we're familiar with. Um, powder vendor certificates, test records, um, and the product as well. The reason we're doing it is to check that the powder meets the spe specification, producing an inspection certificate. So with a build platform, uh, I know I talked earlier about build platform. Um, what we're interested in here is that you're actually able to get the test pieces you need out of the size of the build platform. And do we need to create different uh, patterns to be able to do that? So the objective within this is to finalize the layout. Um, SPC obviously retain digital files and state of endorsement. 3TRPD produce and provide build layouts. And our role is to review and endorse those against guidelines, against experience, against what industry standards exist. So again, we're checking that people are suitably qualified and experienced. Um, we're checking digital file version control. And uh, th th this, just on that, this relates back to another benefit of the virtual stores process is that keeping lots of different versions of a component in a warehouse, you can do that all through uh, having the digital files with a local production method. So it simplifies that. Uh, labeling and dimensioning of test specimens, important standard, we know it. Um, location and or orientation of part and test specimens on the build platform. Uh, obviously meaning that the 3D mod model for manufacturing inspection uh, is ready. Producing a statement of endorsement, again, by LR. And then on to when you actually build the thing. Um, so. The point is to actually produce the components and specimen, specimens as per the build layout, which is what 3T RPD did. Again, as part of our audit review, we're looking at standard operating procedures, build programs, the machine, the route cards. The facility audit has fed into this. The previous slide on build platform layout, it's all feeding into this. So post-processing. Things like thermal treatments, uh, removing from the build, build flat platform, surface finishing, like we do today um, with heat treatment records. It's our same role, again, going and checking the heat, treat, heat treatment charts, making sure that was carried out correctly. And inspection. So once we've done all those exciting activities, it's confirming the part properties and characteristics through traditional mechanical testing, NDE, it could be new NDE, it could be the way you did it before. And again, LR is there, and our purpose is to witness those tests, review and endorse reports, analysis of the data for acceptance, and everything we do for test labs today is uh, qualification records for operators, PPE, methods, procedures, equipment maintenance, calibration, accreditation of the test laboratory, um, Producing inspection reports, uh, tests, Wisner, tests have been witnessed and reports stamped by an LR surveyor, um, and that the inspection has been completed in accordance with standards and specifications. So one thing we did with uh, this job was um, we actually did some salt, uh, fault seeding. 
Uh, we use CT scanning to detect things like porosity, inclusions, internal channel geometry. So we made a, they made a duplicate part with four seeded reference voids at the maximum allowable defect size, obviously to check against. Then, we, then they scan the actual part using the same setup as they did for this part, validation. And things like the manufacturing records as well. So uh, through all of this, it's all about traceability. It's all about building confidence through having a robust set of records. Again, we're checking things like equipment and cal calibration records, manufacturing facility controls and procedures. We have LR reports, uh, all produced in a final technology qualification report by 3TRPD, which we review our metallurgical specialists, manufacturing specialists review this against industry standards that exist or are developing, our guidelines as well, and standards that are applicable. So here's the actual parts, all done, certificate issued, uh, part of our team and 3T RPD team there, uh, final issue in the certification, which like I say, I think we did the back end of last year. So this is just a summary of everything we're doing. So in services, we're providing guidance and consultation to the industry. This is to oil and gas, this is construction, we're doing it for marine, we're doing it for the power generation market. Getting involved right from the very start. About material supply certification and assurance, facility assurance, part and product assurance. We're working on joint industry projects, um, on certification of laser power AM components. Uh, non-metallics, achieving regulatory and code compliance, joining of AM products and materials. This is something we started last year. Uh, knowledge sharing activities as well for our memberships with ISO, ASTM, ASME committees. Um, we're a member of the UK National Strategy Group. Um, through the LRF, we do PhD funding research. Uh, and the LRF roadmap exists as well, which I've talked about. And awareness activities as well. Uh, we hold... We issue a quarterly, quarterly knowledge bulletin, which uh, if you're not signed up for, I'd, I'd recommend it. There's some quite useful stuff in there. Uh, we host webinars as well at a regular basis. Um, we go to technology conferences and industry forums as well. So that was sort of a quite quick whistle-stop tour of it. But if you want to get in touch, there's myself, there's uh, product launch manager and Andy Imry, and there's technical lead David Hardacre, who uh, was going to come today but couldn't make it. Um, so, yeah, get in touch any time would be the best advice. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you.